Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 14th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show, usually from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the Dunleavy administration's apparent, and to us, disappointing, decision not to call a special session this fall on fiscal issues. Second, we discuss the kabuki theater that various sides are making of the Alaska LNG project. And third, we look at the growing debate around whether the Permanent Fund Corporation should open an Anchorage office. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get started this morning on this uh, topic of the special session, because we kept hearing that, oh, there has to be a special session before the next uh, before the next one, because we got so many unan- unanswered questions and so many things going on and so many. But now it looks like there will be no special session. Uh, Jeff Landfield over at the Landmine wrote about this on Sunday. What is um, what what's going on here? Give us your take on what's happening here. Well, uh Jeff wrote a, a piece. Uh, you, you, you can sort of see this coming uh, in terms of, of what the governor was doing or not doing in terms of preparing for a special session. Um, and there was the fact that during the vetoes uh, that he did of the FY24 budget, he vetoed out the, 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 the appropriation to cover the cost of the special session, which was sort of a big hint uh, about this. But he had made a lot uh, during his in frequent press re- press conferences during the session about resolving the fiscal issue um, and had gone so far as to say that he was going to propose a sales tax. He was prepared to propose a sales tax and uh, was pushing forward and, and said that he would push forward with a special session if it wasn't revolved, resolved, if the issue wasn't resolved during the regular session. Um, to pick up Jeff's reporting on this, uh, and this is from the Sunday landmine for those of you who are interested. To pick up Jeff's reporting on, on this, he says, but since since uh, since the, the regular session, then the price of oil has been steadily rising, hitting $90 a barrel today. That was Thursday of last week. The first time it's reached that price since November 22nd. And significant disagreement remains between the House and the Senate on what kind of fiscal reforms are needed. Leaders of both bodies told the Alaska Political Report, that's Jeff's publication, that there is now little to no desire for a fall special session. While Dunley, Dunleavy floated the, the idea of a special session earlier this year, a, spe, a senior official from his administration told us, the governor is not going to call a special session if the legislature does not want to do it. <laughs> Dunleavy also vetoed money from the budget that would have paid for a special session, uh, though it still uh, could be funded in the supplemental budget. So uh, basically, uh, Jeff's reporting, and I've, and I've heard the same thing independently. Jeff's reporting is that the administration uh, really has no desire to go into a special session now. Oil prices are up. It looks like the uh, the FY24 budget will uh, will uh, be funded, um, and uh, and they're just gonna gonna let it ride for another session. The the, pro, the 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 advantage of the special session this year was that it was outside of a an election year. And there was a hope, um, uh, maybe misguided, but the hope that legislators would be more responsible, they would look more long term, they would uh, be more uh, susceptible to finding compromise in the same way that the that the 
that the fiscal policy working group did a few years ago, that they would be more uh, uh, prone to find a compromise to resolve the fiscal situation in a non-election year. If you don't call a special session this year, you push the issue into next year, uh, into the next uh, uh, legislative session, and uh, and it'll be an election year, and nobody and nobody will want to move on. Uh, everybody will be going to their to the barricades, to the mattresses, uh, on on their issues, on fiscal issues, and nobody will want to be right. seen as as compromising. So that's that's the loss of not going into uh, not going into a special session this year. There, there is one thing that that really strikes me about this. Alaska is often said to have the strongest governor, uh, strongest powers for a governor of any state in the nation, and that's that's in part, largely in part, because of the governor's line item veto uh, powers in in as number one, number two, that it takes four fifths of the legislature to override um uh, a veto on on appropriations uh so it gives the governor a, a the the view is it gives the governor a very strong hand with respect to especially with respect to fiscal issues this governor has demonstrated that it's that it's a weak hand uh at least he's playing it uh, playing these strong powers is a weak hand um the because of the way in which the pfd arises it's a as as decided by the Supreme Court in 2017, it's an, it's a legislative appropriation, and because the governor can't raise legislative appropriations, when the legislature short run, shortfalls the uh, the PFD, the governor really can't do anything about it directly. Now, a lot of people have pointed out that that other governors, strong governors, uh, would have vetoed uh, the budget and said, look, if you're not going to include the PFD, you're not, we're not, we're not finished yet. We're going to go back. We're going to redo the budget and we're going to have a PFD in it. Others have pointed out that he could be selective in his vetoes and punish those legislators that uh, vote for, uh, vote for PFD cuts, that there are, that the governor has the power to be a strong governor with respect even to the PFD. Uh, But this governor has played, has played those cards weekly. Um, W E A K L Y, um, ha, <laughs> ha, 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 but, almost, has, but almost both, almost both ways. Yeah. Ha, has, has played those cards, uh, uh, the cards he has, he has dealt. If he really believes in the PFD, the governor has played those cards poorly and, uh, played those powers poorly. And this, the failure to call another special, uh, f- failure to call a special session to lead on a special session and to call a special session, I think it's just another demonstration of how weak he has uh, he has chosen to to play those cards, to 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 defer essentially to say I'm not going to call a special session. I'm not going to try to lead if the legislature doesn't want to do it. Is to essentially say, nah, legislature, you get to control this stuff. I mean, legislature, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. I don't, I don't, I don't want to do it, and um, and so we won't do it. And that's um, it's disappointing. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, again, I think this is almost more at this point a commentary on the governor's overall performance than it is specifically on this one issue. This is just a microcosm of what the governor has been doing pretty much the last three years. I mean, he came out running strong and it seems like he got, you know, whacked and spanked pretty hard. And now he's been kind of like a whipped puppy the whole time. I mean, he ran on this platform of standing tall for Alaska and he's going to do the PFD, but at every opportunity where he had the chance to take a stand and to stand tall and to make some things. I mean, you were just talking about vetoing the whole budget or portions of the budgets, forcing them back to the table. He's not willing to do that. And again, I'm not quite sure why. I mean, this is a lame duck session for him. He's uh, he doesn't have anything else to do. I mean, he, he may have higher aspirations, but if you were going to take a stand, you should rather, you know, you could rally your base here for the strong pro PFD crowd and really put some, you know, really put some work in and nothing, nothing seems to be happening. And, and again, offering a sales tax, you know, saying he's going to offer a sales tax and then actually never doing anything, saying that these things are going to happen and then backing back up. I mean, this is, I mean, is, is this not in your mind, an example of extremely weak leadership? Well, it is. I mean, he's 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 playing he's playing those cards weekly. I mean, we 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 talked at the time of the election. We talked 
uh, at the time the governor was reelected, we talked about the governor having an opportunity, the governor being at a fork in the road, right? He could either go for a legacy like Hammond and, and fight for the things he believed in, use the powers that the Alaska Constitution gives the governor, uh, fight for the things he believes in to try to carve a legacy out. Or he could just continue to go along to get along and try to position himself as, you know, somebody who talks a lot about federal issues, for example, as he does, um, uh, and try to position himself for a Senate run uh, somewhere down the road. Um, and it looks like, in all honesty, it looks like he's chosen the second course. I mean, he's trying to he's trying to, to avoid creating controversy. Um, uh, uh, even among his base, um, and just push for, uh, just push to, to get through the session, complain a lot about the federal overreach, you know, file suits against the federal government. But when it comes to things that are really matter to Alaska families, like the PFD, just sort of, you know, just sort of let it go, just sort of roll over and, and play dead. And it's, um, and that's, and that's the course he's chosen. So I, if, uh, if, the legislature is not going to call itself into special session. If the governor doesn't call itself into special session, then, you know, we're just going to roll into an election year. Um, and, and we're not going to solve this issue next year either. I mean, oil prices are going to be up or oil prices are going to be down. Even if they're down, even if it looks like we're hitting another crisis, another funding crisis, uh, the legislature is not going to solve this issue in an election year. And so he's really got, I mean, he's passing up the next to last chance he has to really help resolve this issue by pushing on the legislature during a non-election year to, to come finally to grips with the fiscal situation we're in. He, here's, I mean, it, it, one other thing has become apparent during this entire process, and that is to resolve the PFD issue, because, because we haven't gotten spending under control, to resolve the PFD issue, there's going to have to be some tax involved. Um, it, some tax to pay for government and take the place of the PFD tax uh, that we've been using to, to pay for government. There's a great case for doing that. I mean, it, it, there's a, it, it has, would have, the tax would have a lower impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. It would have a lower impact on the Alaska economy than, than PFD cuts are having. I mean, we talk about, there's a bunch of stuff in the papers about, you know, Alaska, wages going down, Alaska becoming a poorer state. Well, part of that's because we've been cutting the PFD. And, and there's a great case to be, to be made for, let's get the PFD resolved. Yes, we're going to have to pay taxes for part of government, but frankly, that will act as a break on the size and scope of government because once you engage the top 20% in paying taxes, they'll push back on government spending the same way that everybody else has tried to. There's a great case to be, to be made for you know, it, for replacing, for substitute taxes in place of PFD cuts now that we're at this point where we haven't cut spending. But but the governor seems to want to avoid doing that. So another another opportunity uh, uh, is passing us by. You know, <clears throat> Brad, I mean, I, I, I hate to be that guy sometimes, but this is what I was concerned about coming into this, you know, in the last election for governor. Uh, was the prior performance of Mike Dunleavy in this kind of just absenteeism. I mean, it's just like he's not there. He's not engaging with the public. He's not participating. I mean, he released his vetoes without even a presser where he's, I mean, supposedly supposed to answer questions as to why he did certain things, you know, according to uh, the law and the Constitution. And he basically just sent it out with a press release and said, here's my vetoes. Um, there is like there's like zero engagement with the governor and the public or pretty much anybody else at this time. And this is, uh, you know, I, I think this is indicative of a larger problem. But I mean, this is this is it. This is the core issue, isn't it? Yeah. He uh, well, from a fiscal standpoint, this is the core issue. The PFD is the core issue. Yeah. Resolving the PFD is is key to the state budget is key to the state economy is key to the impact of. Of, of, of state government on Alaska families from a fiscal standpoint. And it is the key issue. And he just, he just doesn't want to face up to it. I mean, it's, it, it, he tried, he tried, I'll, uh, we need to give him that, that in 2018, when he came in or 2019, when he came in that first session, he tried to, to, to reduce the cost of government and the blowback from that 
uh, I think, scarred him um, and has continued to scar, continued to affect the course of of his administration ever since, both in the remainder of the first administration, the first term, and now uh, now into the second term. Um, he doesn't like to engage on issues. He doesn't like to engage with reporters. He doesn't like to explain himself. He just sort of likes to do it and go on. It, it is, sometimes it reminds me of, of, of a different system of government, a, a king and a prime minister, right? The, the king sort of sits in the castle and occasionally says stuff, um, and the prime minister is the one who really runs the government. Well, in this case, on fiscal issues, I mean, Bert's really the prime minister. I mean, Bert's really running the, the, the fiscal function of the government, and, and Dunleavy's just letting him. And it's a waste. It's a waste of the powers that the governor has. It's a waste of, of, the, of the constitutional role uh, that, that the Alaska Constitution creates uh, for our governor. We the, the founders wanted a strong governor. The founders gave the governor powers to, to direct the state. Um, and he's just sort of, you know, he's just sort of let him let, letting those uh, atrophy uh, during his term, during his term as governor. So I, it, it's, it's disappointing. It's um, it, it's, it's leaving an adverse impact on the Alaska economy. It's leaving an adverse impact on Alaska families. Um, and I don't think it will serve him well. Uh, if he if he has desires for additional office and if he runs for additional office, I think, you know, people are going to bring up the fact that he didn't do what he said he would do during his terms right. in office. But but yeah, that's well, what I he's would, chosen to do. I agree with that. And I think some of the listeners agree. Terry says with his performance as a governor, I would not vote for him in another position. Um, I mean, I think that's a <laughs> that's a valid point. I mean, if you're not going to stand tall for the things that you ran on. As a governor, why would I want to vote for you for any additional offices that, you know, if you, you know, if you can't even because, it, again, it's not like he fought and lost. It's like he's not even fighting for it. That's the worst part of this whole thing. Um, and, yeah, if he wanted if he was so scarred from the first go around in 2018, 2019, why would you run for governor again at that point? And, and he's leaving he's leaving legislators dangling. I mean, yeah. uh Ben Carpenter, if I were Ben Carpenter, I'd be a little a little upset about what's happened. I mean, Ben got out there on the sales tax. Ben pushed the sales tax. Uh, he Ben was a member of the, the fiscal study working group trying to resolve this issue. And the governor's just sort of left him dangling out there. Um and I, I I'm not I'm not sure how legislators are going to react to, you know, the governor continuing to just sort of, you know, leaving them out there drifting around. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, disappointing to say the least right now as to what's going on. It's very disappointing. And um, we had hoped to see him, especially in a lame duck session, be able to do more. Wasted opportunities is what Donna says. And I would agree with that. Back with more, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, bringing, on, bringing the pain on this Tuesday of the truth bomb. Uh, just talking about the governor and uh, the, I mean, lack of... Uh, fortitude and standing tall for Alaskans on the PFD in the special session issue. But now we move over to the latest, the Kabuki Theater that is the Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline. Uh, and we've talked about this in the past. AKLNG uh, now, of course, making headlines. The latest article here from last week talking about conservation groups now suing to stop the Alaska LNG project. And Brad, you say this is all basically Kabuki theater at this point. It is, Michael. I, the, the, the one headline that had some significance from last week about the AKLNG project wasn't about the AKLNG project. The headline was LNG Japan, which is a consortium of, of Japanese uh, LNG purchasers, buyers, buys 10% stake in Australia, Australian natural gas project. And, and that reports on uh, uh, one of the Australian projects had uh, the owner was, was, was looking for end users to become part of the consortium that uh, uh, part of their LNG consortium. That's what producers, uh, LNG producers try to do. They try to get end users locked in as an, a part owner of the project because once the end users locked in as a part equity owner of the project, they're much less likely to you know, try to avoid um, uh, 
the purchase contracts uh, uh, if they if they start going going bad because it would affect their equity position. So you you try to get you try to get your end users in as part of the as part of the equity part of the ownership of a of a project. And and one of the Australian natural gas projects got LNG Japan, a, a significant uh, participant in um, uh, in in LNG purchases in Japan, uh, to buy a 10 percent stake uh, in their project. Uh, it doesn't read LNG Japan buys 10 percent stake in Alaskan natural gas project. Uh, Alaska has been marketing theirs for forever. Uh, it reads 10 percent stake in Australian natural gas project, and that's. And that I think is is the most significant uh, headline from uh, uh, from the week. It demonstrates, I think, that what what Japan's doing with the Alaska project is using it as a stalking horse, using it as a negotiating tool, using it as leverage. That if you don't, if you if if you know if you don't sell, if you don't do what I want you to do on on your project, I can always go back to Alaska and look, you know, right. Rahm Emanuel and and the Biden administration are trying to push me to Alaska anyway. Um, I, th- I think it demonstrates this sort of activity demonstrates that 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 Japan's re- and others are really using Alaska as a as a stocking horse. But but that doesn't mean <laughs> that doesn't mean the LNG project doesn't have it any use. Um, the headline in the in the Anchorage Daily News that you referenced: conservation groups sue to stop LNG project. Uh, a couple of, uh, of, of conservation groups, the Sierra Club and Center for Biological Diversity, uh, uh, filed suit against the Department of Energy about a Department of Energy decision to approve exports from the LNG project. Uh, their claim is that the uh, Department of Energy had not fully assessed uh, the climate and environmental harms. So, if the project's really, if the project's really not a real project, I mean, if it's just a stalking horse, why are the why are the environmental groups uh, uh, suing on it? And the answer is probably fundraising. Uh, the answer probably is I was say they're probably using me as a stocking horse as well to raise. So I mean, we're the whole thing. We're just the puppet for everybody around us at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's it, that that sort of that sort of is is what become is is what sort of turns out to be the case. I mean, the we're, we're the Alaskans are trying to push the project, but nobody else really believes in the project. But they want to use it for their own particular purpose. Um, I think with uh, with the Willow decision, the Biden administration's Willow decision, uh, uh, and the and the loss to the to the environmental groups and the conservation groups there, uh, they want to keep the Alaska issue alive. And and oh, here's another Alaska project, and here's another federal approval that that another Alaska project got. So let's go after that, and let's tell our you know tell our contributors and tell our supporters that hey, we're still going after. Alaska project. So I, the whole thing about LNG increasingly to me is becoming kabuki theater. It's becoming, you know, people, people sort of shadow puppeting uh, uh, moves that really don't have to do with, really don't have to do with Alaska LNG, um, uh, but using it for their own purpose. The Japanese using it for the purpose of, of making it a stocking horse in their negotiations with with other purchasers, the environmental groups making it a, a stocking horse uh, uh, in in their fundraising efforts and in their efforts to show that they're out there, you know, defending defending the environment. And the poor LNG project just sort of continues to spin on with uh, without making any real progress. I mean, it, it's possible at some point, you know, they're going to have an announcement that says, "Hey, Japan buys a portion of the Alaska LNG project." And if that ever comes to pass, if that headline ever reads. Uh, LNG Japan buys 10% stake in Alaska. If that headline ever reads uh, buys a stake in Alaska natural gas project, then then we're going to be talking about something that may have become real. But until that happens, uh, I don't think <laughs> I, I I don't think we're 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 just sort of spinning our our wheels in the mud right. here, and I don't I don't think we're really making any progress. Well, and there's really a third group that's uh, again using it as a stocking horse or as a money generation machine, and that is, of course, all the entities that are surrounding this, the non governmental or quasi governmental agencies that are that are spinning around this, soaking up the money. Uh, I mean, there have been millions and millions of dollars of public funds that have been expended over the last thirty years that I've been covering the issue of AKLNG. 
that has been, you know, oh, we're going to study it, or we're going to do this, or we're going to create a, a working group, or we're going to create a, a port authority, or we're going to do something. And they have consumed millions of dollars over the last 30 years at studying it or or trying to pursue it or do whatever. That's a third group that's out there making a living, essentially, off pushing a quasi-sentient project forward. I mean, that's what's happening right now. Oh yeah, it's, it's it's millions, it's hundreds of millions and billions probably uh, by now. If you go all the way back to the original, uh, uh, the original start of the project, I mean, it's 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 one of those things that you think makes sense, right? There's a lot of natural gas in the world, or there's there's a lot of natural gas up on the North Slope. There's a demand for natural gas in the world, and you would think that it makes sense to link one plus the other, but. Every time, every time LNG sort of, every time the Alaska project sort of gets close, something happens in the marketplace. I mean, we were sort of, we were sort of close in the mid 2000s, 2006, 2007. Murkowski had, had, had pressed forward on the negotiations with the producers. Um, and then Palin came in and sort of broke the back of that and wanted to go a different direction. But that, but at the time, the market in the lower 48 looked like it was going to be gas short. And the Alaska project suddenly uh, made sense again. But then we had shale gas. Then we had the, the shale revolution in the lower 48, beginning in about 2008. Uh, and shale gas suddenly became prevalent in the lower 48. We have, we, we now have, you know, we have Japan that's trying to get off uh, uh, other sources of supply for energy. We have Europe that got shut down by uh, uh, Russia or shut itself off from Russia in response to the Ukraine war, all those sort of things make you think, okay, there's going to be an increased global demand again. The problem is there's a lot of global suppliers. I mean, the, there's Australia, there's Mozambique, there's Abu Dhabi, there's Qatar, there's, you know, the list goes on and on and on of, of LNG suppliers. And sort of just like happened in the mid 2000s when shale gas exploded in the lower 48 and sort of destroyed the market for, for Alaska gas down in the lower 48, we've had this explosion of LNG supplies, LNG opportunities uh, globally that are much better positioned and, and much more economic than, than Alaska. Doesn't mean Alaska doesn't have a use. I mean, the, the, the Japanese are using it as a stocking horse. The, envir the environmental groups are using it as a stocking horse. And you're right, you know, the, the, study in, the studies industry is using it as a reason to sort of continue on with all the studies. But it's not it's not progressing the, the project forward. And in all reality, when you look particularly at this headline and look at the details of the of the agreement between uh, LNG Japan and the Australians last uh, last week, um, it's just not it's it's not a realistic project. that's uh, that's uh, that, that's staying together. It's much from, more it's much more kabuki theater from your perspective as an oil and gas guy i mean oil and gas attorney and being part of a lot of these deals and and seeing this from you know from start to finish uh you know is there a path forward for alaskan because you talk about you know the market conditions all of a sudden oh market conditions are right for alaska it's good we start talking about it and then six months later the market conditions change but we know there's this long tail in building out anything that has to do with that so is there any path forward for alaskan gas to actually come to fruition where somebody realizes, yeah, I mean, the market conditions may be perfect today or they may not be perfect today, but we know that in the future this is going to be necessary, so we're going to commit to it. I mean, is there a path forward for Alaska natural gas? Not, not, in, the, not in the free market, not in the, not in the, in the capitalist system. Um, the only path forward for Alaska natural gas, and I think Lisa recognizes this, and I think others have recognized this, the only path forward is huge government subsidies. <laughs> Uh, that that support the project and uh, and make the project economics work because the private sector isn't really having to pay for it. Government's going to have to pay, government's paying for it, and and I think that truly, if if Alaska LNG would ever go forward, it would be on the backs of government funding, uh, as opposed to on the backs of uh, on the backs of private sector contracts and private sector funding. So that's where it is. I you know, and you and I you know, think that's abhorrent that, that we don't want the, the government interfering. We don't want, even though it would be good for Alaska, maybe sort of in the short run, we don't want the government funding these sorts of projects. If the private sector doesn't think a project's worthwhile, then it shouldn't be done. 
but that's, I mean, there are going to, there are going to be people, including the, the studies industry that, that you talked about a moment ago, there are going to be people who continue to push forward for that and say, oh, you know, it's important for Alaska to have this project. It's important for the world to have this project. It's another source of, you know, of free world supply to Japan, gets them off, gets away from Russian supply. Um, so it's important for the, for the free world to have that. But the only way it goes, I mean, you, you look, you look around the world at the LNG projects that are progressing and the amount of supply that's coming forward. And there's really not a place for Alaska. And, and, and so you look around the world and you say, it's not going to happen. And then, you know, people who want it to happen, just keep pressing forward with, with more and more government funding. That's, that's the success, right. success story for, for Alaska LNG to have the government well, pay for the damn thing. So we're sitting on 17 trillion cubic feet of gas and we can't do anything with it. And uh, it's a, you know, maybe down the road, uh, maybe years from now, maybe it will eventually come to fruition, but not looking forward here in the short term. We're looking at, we're, we're sitting on 23 trillion cubic feet of gas, but it's 700 miles from market. <laughs> yeah. And exactly. And, yeah. And it's, and, you know, so who somebody talks about, oh, you know, someday the, Bering Sea will meld enough that we'll be able to get it out uh, by barge, maybe. Uh, but it's um, it, it's not it, it, it's not an economic project. And the other the other problem, I mean that that people talk about now is the window is closing for LNG projects. That that you know solar and and other renewable sources of energy are coming on strong, and so the window is closing for high, for the hydrocarbon market. And it takes a long time to pay these things out. Even if, even if the government funds it, it takes a long time for to pay these things out. So right. the window, the window of opportunity for the project seems to be closing as well. I mean, I know they've talked about, uh, you know, liquefaction, shipping it via LNG containers from the North Slope. I know that they're, you know, they're they're going to be trucking some gas down to Hill Corp's building a liquefaction plant on the North Slope to truck it to Fairbanks and things like that. I mean, it's just kind of a crime that here in Alaska, we could potentially be importing LNG down in South Central because we just can't get our poop in a group and can't make it work out to get our own gas 700 miles away. We ship it 7,000 miles away over the ocean, and it's cheaper than it is bringing it out of our own backyard. It is, Michael, but it's expensive to to you know to build the pipeline. It's a, it's expensive to build the kit uh, uh, to do it. So yeah, the economics. I mean, the economics ought to rule, right? If we can get gas cheaper. By bringing it up from British Columbia, from an LNG plant in British Columbia, can get gas cheaper than we can by than we can by investing in a pipeline and bringing it down from the slope. Then we ought to do that. I mean, wh- why why should we punish the Alaska economy by forcing it to pay more uh, to support uh, uh, an LNG pro- uh, an Alaska LNG project when the Alaska economy can have lower energy costs by bringing it by bringing it in from someplace else? I mean, it's, it's the economics, the economics should, should control the situation. It's, it's, um, it, it's unfortunate in, in a philosophical sense. Yes, we ought to be able to use our own good, our own resources to supply ourselves, but if the economics don't support it, we ought, we, we, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't, you know, build a, a pipeline just because, you know, we want to, we want to find a use for our own gas. We, we, right. We should let the economics control the situation. Is, is there something economical long, long term or is it just not? I mean, where, you know, once it's built, then it becomes over the course of a 50 year term, it becomes better and, and sustainable. Or, uh, again, that's going to all require a massive amount of government infused money to make it work. It's going to require a massive amount of government infused money. If there was if there was an economic if there was an economic case for Alaska LNG where it made money over the long term, you would be able to find investors to do it. The state's done a the state's done the right thing, I think, uh, of of trying to to get the project up and and showing what the project could be, showing what the kit that would be required, showing how you would how you would you know extract the gas how you would get the gas to tidewater how you would get it on lng i think that i think the state probably has done a good has has done a, a useful job of showing how you would use the resource but the next step of of the economics of, of then using it finding the economics of, of using it um I, I mean that's just a massive amount of money it, it is you know 40 billion dollars let's see 
when did they do that estimate? Back in 2020, maybe 2019? Well, no, it was before COVID. So anyway, a massive amount of money, $40 billion, probably $50, $60 billion with inflation uh, now, uh, a massive amount of money to, you know, to, to, to do the project. Just keep, it's almost the size of the permanent fund, right? I mean, 60 billion, 40 to $60 billion is almost the size of the permanent fund. It would take the permanent fund in terms of money to, 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 to build this project. And that's just, that's a huge investment. So if there was, if there was a case for how that played out and how you made money over the long term. I think a consortium of private investors would have would have come together and 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 and, and made it reality. But there there just isn't. I mean, it's it's compared to alternatives. Compared right. to the alternative of what's going on in Canada, Gulf Coast, elsewhere in the world, it just doesn't make economic sense. So we remain a land bank for now, and uh, and maybe one day the metrics work out, but. Uh, Maybe technology increases, maybe demand or maybe supply drops somewhere else. Maybe other basins are exhausted and we look, you know, maybe that's what it is. Uh, I mean, it's 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 interesting to see and, and frustrating to a point because we are a resource rich state. And when we can't access our own resources to utilize them here, let alone sell them somewhere else. Definitely a frustrating combination for sure. I'll, I'll absolutely agree with that. It is it is frustrating. I mean, you see. You see a bunch of gas, you see a market out there and you go, ah, we ought to be able to do that. Right. But it's, it's the economics of getting it from there to there that, uh, that, uh, that just don't work. So yeah, but just don't throw us all off except, except for Kabuki theater, except for people who right. want to, who want to, who want to take advantage of, Hey, it could happen. So, you know, well, and again, people are making careers out of this. That's what kills me is that people are making careers out of this idea of going back and spending massive amounts of government money to justify spending massive amounts of government money. And it's just like, it's a self-licking ice cream cone. That's, uh, that's for sure. There you go. If we, if we could find a way to tap into, tap into Japan's use of, use of it as a leverage and the conservation group's use of it as a leverage, we'd find a tap way to tap into the economics of that. We'd make some money. <laughs> yeah, we can leverage it. Maybe I need to start a new company. I don't know. All right. We're continuing with the weekly Top three, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, comes in and dives into this thing with us to talk about the various issues around the state. Uh, today, we're on to number three, which is the new Permanent Fund Corporation office, which you wouldn't think would be that contentious, but it may have actually led to the departure of some people from the Permanent Fund Corporation and more. There's some deeper waters here at play, Brad, in this whole thing. Um, I think they're trying to do the right thing as far as being able to get the right people hired. And some people are so stuck in the old ways of Juno is the only answer. Uh, give us your take here on what's going on with this. Well, this is definitely definitely a Juno versus Anchorage issue. Um, the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation has uh, has pressed forward on its or is pressing forward on its uh on his proposed uh, opening of an Anchorage office, uh, and uh, and making that an alternative place of uh, of employment and alternative office for uh, people who otherwise would be uh, would be in the Juno office, and the Permanent Fund Corporation is pressing forward on that, saying that there are people who they who they will be able to bring on board uh, to an Anchorage office who will live in Anchorage who would not come on board. To a Juno office, and that justifies having having an Anchorage office. I, I'm 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 you, you know there may be good arguments for why they need an Anchorage office. That isn't one. <laughs> the, the The reason is that it, it, you you don't say you, you can't you can't stop and say oh there's somebody we want that would that would be in an Anchorage office that wouldn't come to a Juno office, and so that justifies opening an Anchorage office. Um, you really have to go through an analysis of, well, who's the next best person that would be, that would go to a Juno office, uh, that doesn't need an Anchorage office that would, that would settle it, settle for a Juno office. And is the difference between the, the talents of the person who insists on Anchorage and the talents of the person who would, who would be satisfied with Juno is the difference between those two so big 
that it justifies opening a, a brand new office for uh, for Anchorage. And um, and I and I doubt I doubt frankly that that they can make that case. I, I I would I would guess knowing the industry, knowing the financial industry, knowing the investment industry, I would guess you're going to find enough people to go to Juno that have enough talent that you don't really you can't really justify having Anchorage because somebody is so much better that they would only go to Anchorage and you have to have an Anchorage office to accommodate right. this, this prima donna that would only go to, only go to Anchorage. Here, here's, here's my concern with an Anchorage office. And it goes back to this in-state, the in-state investment program that, uh, that the permanent fund corporation had for a, for a moment. Juno, as, 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 as much as we like to complain about it, from a legislative standpoint, being its own little, its own little weather, its own little uh, 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 bubble, in, in, bubble. Thank you. Um, it, it's it's not it, that really doesn't harm it. I don't think from a permanent permanent fund corporation standpoint. Um, there's not a whole lot of private sector businesses in uh, Juno that would go that go lobby. You know the the permanent fund corporation for investment uh, in in their projects. I'm concerned that there would be that that we would have that problem uh, if we had uh, people up in uh, Anchorage. I'm concerned that a part of this is Anchorage people wanting to get their hands on the permanent fund or businesses wanting to get their hands on permanent fund money, trying to get an office in Anchorage and because it will be more available to them to to push and to lobby and to and to you know develop relationships with people to push for instant to push for in-state investments by the permanent fund corporation. That's, that's, that's a concern that, that I have. I, I, I think there is an advantage, frankly, uh, in the bubble in the Juno bubble from the standpoint of the permanent fund corporation, because it's out of the, 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 the ability of the Anchorage business community to push for influence, uh, right. To, right. To, yeah, to push for influence on over permanent fund investments. The other piece of this, I think it's just a, I think it's just an Anchorage Juno fight uh, about, you know, the government, the governor is, is sometimes accused probably rightfully of trying to gradually move government. I mean, sort of like Sarah Palin, gradually move government out of Juno into Anchorage. And this is just a piece of that. Um, and, uh, and there was the availability of some office space at uh, Department of Environmental Quality, Department of Environmental Conservation, and they said, "Oh well, it doesn't cost us any office space because the state would otherwise pay for it through ADEC, um, and so we're going to we're going to use that. We got to buy some furniture and stuff like that. But I, but it's but it's really I think the I think the big battle is the concern about moving a piece of another piece of government portion of another piece of government to Anchorage. I, uh, in the in the long run, probably doesn't make a big a big difference. We're probably not talking about a huge amount of dollars for for office space, but I I don't think the justifications there in terms right. of we've got to have this office for this unique individual right. who otherwise is going to make us zillions of dollars, but wouldn't well, come on board if we if we made him go to Juno. I mean, I guess the positives are it's essentially a net zero uh, revenue. I mean, they don't have to pay for office space. They only have to pay for the equipment and the furniture. They're able to hire talent that may not want to be trapped in Juno. They may want to come. I mean, I think there's some positives in that regard. But my question is, in light of everything that's happening today, and especially post-COVID, why aren't you just hiring people where they're at? Why aren't you just hiring people? It's not like these people have to be in an office uh, face to face. I mean, a, a satellite office doesn't achieve that. I mean, it just means that they're 500 mi or 1500 miles away in, in Anchorage versus Juno. Why wouldn't you just hire them on the spot and allow them to remain where they're at? If the remote work is, you know, is such a thing, why would this even be a big deal at this point? And then you have well, people actually quit inside the thing over this whole issue. Yeah. Um, well, you would you, you want people in Alaska. I mean, if if you want you want those dollars, those salary dollars or or bonus dollars or whatever kind of dollars you're paying to these people, you want those in Alaska. You want them spent on Alaska real estate, spent on Alaska groceries, spent in Alaska restaurants, spent you know traveling in Alaska. So you want to you want to. You want it. You want to bring those dollars as much as you can into Alaska. Now, if there's some unique, as I say, if there's some unique individual that's going to make you a zillion dollars 
but refuses to live in, in Juneau. A zillion dollars more than the next best, uh, then, but refuses to live in Juneau. Then, yeah, okay, let's look at alternatives. But no one's made that case. I mean, what, what they've said is some people want to live in Anchorage. Okay. But, you know, are they so, are those, are they absolutely saying they will not live in Juneau, A? And B, are they so much better than the next best person? Who will live in Juno that uh, that it justifies justifies the cost? I, I, but you do want them in Alaska someplace. I mean, you don't want them living in Chicago or Dallas or Houston. Well, they talked about opening up a a, a, a branch office or a, a satellite office in New York because they were trying to do that. So, I mean, it, you know, there's some argument for some of those things, but uh, again, I, I'm just scratching my head overall. This has been, again, the Anchorage Juno problem from the very beginning is that this is really a tug of war about where government resides in the state. Yeah. And I, and I think my point is I, my point is there's some downside from it. I mean, if you put them in the Anchorage environment, you put you expose them to Anchorage, you know, people who who have great ideas about how to spend the, the permanent fund money on in-state projects. If you expose them to that environment, I'm concerned that there's a that there's a problem that uh, we may get uh, we may get some dollars directed to Alaska projects that shouldn't go to Alaska projects just because we we've, we've put them in that uh, in that sort of environment. I mean, I'm not I'm not necessarily for or against this, Brad. I just you know if it's net zero, if it's a, if it's revenue neutral, apparently with the exception of maybe some office furniture, okay. But I mean, I just. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand. I'm a huge advocate of remote work. I've been an advocate for years. I've been doing it for years personally. And I just think, why do we have to be trapped in one area where we could do it somewhere else? Um, other than the fact that I love to watch the people spin their wheels over how <laughs> Juno, oh, we've got to leave everything here because otherwise, I mean, a, a town that has become so dependent on government largesse, I love to see him squirm a little bit, quite honestly. That's just me, my personal take on it. Yeah, I think there's a great case. I mean, I think there's a great case for moving the legislature to Anchorage. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not oh, trying to be Juno oh, Juno centric here. You want you want the legislators in 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 your largest city. You want them exposed to to people when they go to the grocery. You know, ordinary people when they go to the grocery, when they go out to restaurants, and when they when they drive down the road. You you want that sort of interaction. I just think it's different with respect to uh, w- w- with respect to the permanent fund corporation. And and here's on the economics Michael, if we've got spare office space in an, in a state office building, why aren't we subleasing it out to the private sector? Why aren't we you know reducing government costs? Why aren't we why aren't we generating some offsetting revenue? Why, why, why are we looking for, oh, we got some spare space. Let's put another government agency. Right, uh, exactly. Well, I'm, the, not, I'm not disagreeing with that either. That's, I mean, you know, if we've got tons of vacant office space around here, let's open that up. I mean, why not make a little bit of that money back? It seems to make sense. Yeah, it's a, I mean, that, that I think is just a, I mean, I think that's just a specious argument. I mean, if, if you, there is an opportunity cost here, if there's spare office space, we could we could market it, we could we could monetize it. Uh, the fact that uh, you know, calling it free free office space just isn't just isn't right. There's an opportunity cost to it. I it, from a from a from a remote work standpoint, yeah, it's great. I mean, remote work is works. I did. I've, you've done it. I've done it. Uh, it's, a uh, it's something that I think we can accommodate, but we do want those dollars somewhere in Alaska. I mean, we do want those, right. those, those wage dollar, those wage dollars or bonus dollars somewhere in Alaska. So, well, it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, and the thing is, is that, as you said, more Kabuki theater, we're fighting over something like that. We're not fighting, but you know, we're, we're arguing over something like this when this is like, it's such a, a, a minor thing in the long run. Um, but you know, I, I can be honest. I don't think I would want to work in Juno, being trapped down there and not being able to go anywhere or do anything, or, you know, at least have the opportunity to, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things. Again, it's a smaller thing in the, in the whole scheme of the entire, of the entire organization. Yeah. So let's compare this issue, the, the, the last issue we're taking up today to the first issue, you know, not having a special session, not resolving our fiscal outlook, not resolving, not resolving the PFD issue, letting PFD cuts just continue to roll along and be the source of uh, the source of uh, the source of government funding. Two, night and day, one's a huge issue, 
one's a one's a, a very very minor issue that you know whether right. whether this guy's in Juneau or Anchorage is very very but we're spending a lot as a government as as newspapers and as as everything we're spending a lot more time on right. that issue than we are on the fact that the governor's not calling a special session and uh, and not progressing forward on the, on finding a fiscal resolution. Well, what do they call that? What's the old axiom? Tripping over a dollar to pick up a dime kind of thing? I mean, that's what we seem to be doing all the time. Jeannie says, why is it important to have wages in Alaska? It's not taxed. And I think the point, I think the point is, I mean, she does have a point in one way, but another way it is going into the local economy. So at least there is money flowing in the local economy that way. But it is not taxed, which again, is a whole nother issue about, you know, remote workers or out of state workers not being taxed on everything as well. So uh, I, there's two issues there, I guess, in that regard. Yeah, I think I think it is. I, it, it's it's important from the standpoint of the private economy. It's important from the standpoint of, you know, the real estate market. Where, 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 where do people uh, spend their 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 you know rent money or their mortgage money? Uh, it's important from you know the standpoint of restaurants, from food, just just you know basic spending. Where do they where do they spend their money? And I think it you know if it's state government, if it's state money, we we generally should want to have that spent in the state and help uh, help bolster the state economy. Thirty so, second final thoughts, Brad. I yeah, it's fun to watch it. It's sort of you know Kabuki. It's another Kabuki theater between Anchorage and Juneau, but. I don't think it's a big issue, and I don't think that uh, that we ought to be pressing forward with the Anchorage office. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find them at ak4sb.com, although probably easier just to go and argue with him on Facebook. He loves to do that, and Twitter, and, and some of the other places. He's got a weekly column in the Alaska Landmine as well. You can go check that out at alaskalandmine.com. Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.